So first of all, I want to welcome everybody to our clinical trials for rare diseases, session one, the industry perspective. Uh, I want to especially welcome our presenters that represent some of the industries that do research and clinical trials in the leukodystrophy space. So I'm hoping you all learn more about some of the research that's taking place that affect us as patients. Um, since y'all didn't join to listen to me, I now want to introduce Laura Liskew from ICON to lead us in tonight's webinar. So Laura, I'll turn the meeting over to you. Thank you very much, Bob. And thank you, Keely. And thank you to the ULF for the honor of hosting this evening's event. Um, I'm Laura Iliescu. I am a director of patient advocacy in the Center for Rare Diseases at a company called ICON PLC. Um, Keely, you can go over to the next slide. Thank you. So to tell you a little bit about myself uh, and ICON, ICON is a company you've probably never heard of, um, and it is a leading clinical research company. So we don't develop drugs, but we help run the cl clinical trials um, that those drugs go through. And uh, in terms of myself, my family are also affected by a rare disease called HHT, which is not a leukodystrophy, but we have certainly been on a rare disease journey for many years as well. Um, so thank you very much. It is my absolute pleasure to host this evening's event. Next slide, please. So this evening, as Bob mentioned, we'll be hearing from four companies who are researching treatments for a number of leukodystrophies and updates on their efforts. Uh, Passage Bio, Swan Bio, Vigil Neuro, and Poxel will share updates on their clinical research programs with you. Um, and following all of their presentations, there will be a Q&A session where you'll have the opportunity to ask the presenters questions. Um, please feel free to enter your questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen at any time, um, but please specify the company that you're directing that question to so that we know. Um, and do keep in mind, we'll actually address them afterwards during the Q&A session. Next slide, please. Um, so I would first like to welcome Dr. Samia Alzadi from Passage Bio. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Alzadi. Over to you. Thank you, Laura. And um, just a quick shout out to Canada. I did my a lot of my medical training in Canada and I moved from Toronto to Columbus, Ohio. Oh, um, my hometown. So <laughs> So thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's quite an honor to be here representing Passage Bio. My name is Samuel Zaidi. I'm a pediatric neurologist with uh, a specialty in neuromuscular disease. I've been in the field of AV gene therapy for just over a decade now, and I am very honored to represent Passage. Um, I was asked to speak on behalf of the GM1 and the Crab A teams at Passage Bio. I'm the clinical lead for the Crab A program, so I um, I am not necessarily the lead for GM1 ganglucidosis gene therapy at Passage Bio, but I hope to do it justice um, and, and I'll provide a brief update. So if we can go to the next slide, I'm um, trying to be mindful that I'm the first speaker. So I know that if I stay on track, I'll make sure everyone else is on track as well. So just a disclosure, we, are, we remain in clinical trials. So the therapies that I am speaking about um, that are currently in clinical trial at Passage, um, uh, the safety and efficacy have not been established in humans. We are still in phase one, two clinical trials. Next, please. So Passage Bio is a genetics medicine company. It is based in Philadelphia, and we have been very privileged to partner with Dr. Jim Wilson, who is one of the pioneers in AAV gene therapy uh, with decades of experience in, in clinical trials and gene therapy. Uh, one of the pioneers who um, has really paved the path for many of the therapies that are currently in trial and some that have been have received FDA approval. We aim to put patients at the center. Uh, we are definitely committed to excellence and um, we are uh, very honored when we receive this invitation and, and hope that the patients and the patient community receives this well. Next, please. 
So just to give a background, we definitely have um, a couple of uh, therapies that are in the pediatric pipeline, but we also have some adult uh, therapies. The current programs that are in trial and in clinic are the GM1 gangliosidosis, that is the most advanced in terms of um, enrollment. We also have the Crab A disease, which I'm currently leading. The MLD program, we were very excited to receive IND approval. It is not yet in clinic. And the FTD dementia program is currently in clinical trial. And we have the option to license about 17 programs in total. Um, at the moment, we are trying to focus on the three clinical programs that are in trial. Next, please. Okay, so I'm going to start with a just a general concept about the way we administer the AAV gene therapy or these therapeutics. And it might be a little different from what um, others have heard about, but we chose to administer this into the cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid that bathes the brain and the spinal cord. Um, we go through a space called the cisterna magna. Uh, so children are usually under anesthesia when they receive this injection. And it's usually conducted by either a neurosurgeon or a neuroradiologist with expertise in interventional radiology. All of the procedures are, are uh, trained and certified for this procedure. And this procedure is the um, mode of administration for both our GM1 gangliocytosis and our CRAB A uh, clinical gene therapy trial. Next, please. So coming from a gene therapy program, I have had the honor to deliver gene therapy in different modes of um, delivery. So I've done intramuscular, I've done intravenous where it's um, delivered through the venous system through a peripheral IV. And this is a um, intracisterna magna. So what does it mean when we do that? Uh, when you are delivering it through this cerebrospinal fluid or the, the fluid that bathes the brain and the spinal cord, we do see that there is a higher percentage of uptake from the brain and the spinal cord. And that's really where we're trying to get much of that therapy in. Um, the, also, the advantage of it is that when you're not delivering it through the vein and going through the, the, the blood circulation, you're not really seeing that much of the side effects that you see with some of the AV gene therapy when it is delivered intravenously. So you're focusing all of the dose, much of it into um, the central nervous system. The other thing is when you're delivering through an IV, you are limited by what we call antibodies. So if you had been exposed to this virus that's used as a shuttle, um, you may develop antibodies and your body starts fighting this therapy. But when we're delivering it directly into this fluid, um, the antibodies have no impact on um, the uptake of this therapy into the nerve cells. Um, the procedure is done um, uh, with an interventional radiologist, which is a radiologist who has experience with doing um, interventions such as the needle that is required for, for this study. And again, it's done under sedation. Next, please. So we're going to start briefly about GM1 gangliosidosis. Once again, I'm not the clinical lead for this, but I'll try to do it justice. It is the most advanced of our clinical programs. Uh, next, please. So GM1 gangliosidosis um, is a very well-recognized lysosomal storage disorder, very well described caused by a gene called the GLB-1 gene. It is a uh, rapidly progressive neurological disease. The children have uh, reduced muscle tone, so they tend to be floppy. Over time, they could become deaf, um, they could become blind, and then they have some um, abnormalities uh, or defects in their bone structure, which we call skeletal dysplasia. It is a rare disease. It is an underserved patient population. And the hope is that with this therapy, we can assess um, this as a therapeutic option for these children. We, we Currently, there is no what we call disease-modifying therapy. So there's no therapy that modifies this disease to make it into a milder um, disease or even eradicate the symptoms of the disease. Next, please. So I'll try to give a little bit of background on the concept of what um, adeno-associated virus or AV gene therapy and some of the gene therapies that use viruses. And this is going to apply to the Crab A disease program. So you'll see another slide for Crab A, um, but it's, it's more or less the same concept. So children with the genetic diseases, there's a defect in the, in the gene, which results in the disease manifesting itself in these children. So the goal is that you use the virus, you take out the genetic material of the virus that allows it to uh, reproduce and infect, and you take out those genes and then you use it as a shuttle um, to carry a healthy gene 
which is the gene that is either missing or defected in, in the child. So in this case, we use the virus AV to insert the GLB-1 gene, a healthy GLB-1 gene. It's packaged into the virus and the virus in large amounts is being delivered through the cisterna magna into that fluid that's bathing the brain and the spinal cord. And then the cells of the brain and the cells of the spinal cord take this virus up, it delivers the gene, and then the body gets rid of all the other viral, viral particles. So the different parts of the packaging system, the body generally gets rid of it over time. Well, that healthy gene that's being delivered stays in the cells of the brain and starts producing a healthy protein. And that protein can stay in the cell. It could be shared beyond the cell to neighboring cells or to the systemic circulation. So this is what we saw in animal models, and that's the goal in, in the children who are enrolled in our clinical trials. So what we call cross-correction is when the virus makes it to the nerve cell, it delivers the healthy gene, the gene is taken up by the cells, and it starts making the protein or the enzyme, and then the enzyme gets shared into neighboring cells or even cells that are further away from the original brain cell that took up the virus. And that's what we call cross-correction, um, which is a concept that allows us to deliver smaller doses into that fluid, but have larger impact and larger effects. Next, please. So the uh, GM1 ganglocytosis is a phase one, two trial. A phase one, two trial is a study where we look at the safety. It is the first time to test this experimental therapy in young children. Um, so all these families and, and the children who are participating, we are quite grateful. Um, they are very brave um, to, and we are quite honored to have them um, assess the safety of this product and look at how effective is it in, in the clinic. So we have two doses and we have children who are diagnosed with the early infantile um, type and children who have the late infantile. Right now where we are is we have completed enrollment for the first cohort, which is the late infantile at a low dose. We've also completed co uh, enrollment in cohorts two and cohort three. And we're currently where the navy blue circle is in cohort four, which is the high dose for early infantile. So well, these children are being followed for two years um, initially, and then there's what we call a long-term follow-up just to make sure that they continue to remain safe. And we look at how effective this therapy has been. Next, please. So this is just a, a summary. I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but just to share with you that we have seven patients that are enrolled in the GM1 gangliosidosis, and we've advanced quite a bit with this um, phase one, two clinical trial. Um, it is our clinical trial that had um, launched um, early on in this company, and it has progressed quite well. And next, please. So where this clinical trial currently is at, it is, it's on track to complete this phase one, two, the first part of the clinical trial, which we call a dose ascending. It's basically you start with a low dose, if it proves to be safe, you go through the high dose, and then you evaluate all the data before you can go to the second part, which is called the confirmatory phase. And that's really confirming that your findings from that first uh, phase of the, of the study or the first part of the study um, continues to be true in a larger number of patients. So we are on track to complete the enrollment by the end of this year, uh, which is wonderful news for the families. Uh, we have had excellent safety data. Um, we have no treatment related serious adverse events or serious side effects that are directly related to the virus. Um, and none whatsoever that were related to the injection in that cisterna magna space that's just at the bottom of, um, of the brain. So we will have um, additional data that is going to be released hopefully soon. Uh, we have submitted an abstract to the World Symposium. So by February, if the abstract is um, accepted, we will have uh, new data to share with the patient community and the scientific community as well. Next, please. So I just want to acknowledge all the patients and the families that made it possible for this phase one, two trial for GM1 gangliocytosis to advance um, at the pace that it has advanced. Um, and I want to thank my colleague, David Weinstein, who um, has given me the honor to share uh, more about his clinical trial. And I will move on to present and share about our CRAB A clinical trial. So I'm the clinical lead for the CRAB-A leukodystrophy trial, and this trial is focused on early infantile CRAB-A disease patients. Um, and similar to the GM1 ganglocytosis, if we can go to the next slide, please. 
it's a lysosomal storage disorder where a toxic substance just accumulates in, in, um, uh, uh, in, in a small part of the cell called the lysosome. Uh, the gene is the GALC gene. The GALC gene uh, codes for the GALC enzyme. And the enzyme is necessary to clear out some of the toxic substances and specifically what we know as psychoceme. We do know that these children, from the time of diagnosis, the symptoms rapidly and quickly progress where the children lose any milestones that they had acquired. So if they were able to hold their head or roll to the side or roll to their belly or back, they quickly lose the ability um, to do so. They have staring episodes, their nerves are involved, they can have seizures at a later stage, as well as blindness and deafness. Now, unfortunately, um, it is a rare and underserved then in, uh, in some parts of the world, uh, stem cell transplant is available in pre-symptomatic children. Uh, we do know here in the United States that is offered for children who are identified through newborn screening, but in many parts of the world, stem cell transplantation is not an approved option uh, or considered standard of care, um, even in the pre-symptomatic children. And for our symptomatic children with Crab A disease, we do not have therapeutic options as of yet. Next, please. So very similar concept to the GM1 gangliosidosis, we do use the virus and the virus acts as a shuttle. It carries the healthy gene that we put into it. It delivers it to the brain cell. Once it, it's injected into that fluid, it makes its way to the brain cells. The brain cells take it up. They get rid of the, the capsule, the AAV capsule, and they hold on to that DNA material that it received. It translates it into the GALC enzyme. It uses the enzyme to clear up any of the toxic substrate and the debris, and it also shares it with neighboring cells and the peripheral nerve. So that's the concept of the cross-correction that we talked about earlier in GM1 gangliosidosis. Next, please. So I wanted to share, this is um, some data. It's a bit of a busy slide, but just to break it down to you to your left, this is a graph looking at when it was delivered in a dog model. So there's actually, a dog model where dogs do develop Crab A disease. Um, it's not a dog model that was um, designed to have Crab A, it's a dog model that um, was found to have Crab A disease. So it made it an excellent model to test therapies. And what we saw in, when we tested the drug PBKR03, which we're currently testing in young children, we saw that in the cerebrospinal fluid, there was um, a, a significant increase and in rise in the GALC enzyme activity, which is missing in our crab A children. And also if you see the psychocene, which is that's the toxic substrate, that's, that's the debris that we need to clear out because it's killing the nerve cells, you can see in the green, it drops tremendously after treatment. We also saw the dogs, their survival was extended um, uh, beyond what would be expected in the untreated dogs. Next, please. So the phase one, two uh, trial, which is called the GALAXY study, it is aimed at early infantile Crab A disease patients. So children who are predicted to develop the more severe type of Crab A disease. And we are doing, um, testing two different doses, a low dose and high dose. We are starting with uh, relatively older infants from four to nine months of age until we can assess the safety of the intracisterna and magna delivery uh, in these young children before we can move on to a younger age group where we assess the low dose. Once we prove safety in our first cohort, uh, we will have uh, uh, an oversight committee review our data, safety data, before we are allowed to go up to a higher dose in the older infants. And we continue to do so where we pause after every group or cohort of patients that are dosed, and we have a meeting with our oversight committees. And just like every clinical trial, there are several oversight committees and agencies that ensure that the safety um, uh, is, is a priority for these children before we complete the part one. Once we finish the part one of assessing two different doses, we look at all our data, look at safety data, and look at what we call efficacy data. How well are these children doing before we can move to the part two, uh, which is what we call confirmatory. And again, we'll follow these children initially for two years, and then we'll follow them for a long-term follow-up. Next, please. So we're enrolling from one to nine months of age, both pre-symptomatic and symptomatic, and they have to have a confirmed diagnosis of early infantile Crab A disease. For the children that are symptomatic, they must have what we call a minimum level 
of neurologic and development function, and that is going to be evaluated by one of our study investigators. Next, please. So the primary outcome is largely dependent on safety. That is, in any phase one, two study, we make sure that that is the primary goal is to look at the safety of this new experimental drug. And then secondary, we wanna look at how are these children doing from a development standpoint? We're looking at enzyme activity, which is usually deficient or absent in children with uh, Crab-A disease. So we look at the response. How much of the enzyme are they producing as a result of treatment in both the blood and the CSF? And that enzyme, if they are making that enzyme, how good is that enzyme clearing the toxic substrate that is naturally accumulating or building up in their brain cells if they're not treated? And we're looking at different outcomes, including the MRI. We're looking at their nerve conduction studies, looking at the electrical um, uh, signals of their nerves to see if they are responding to treatment. Next, please. Okay, so study components, children come in for a screening process and then dosing, and then they continue to follow up with the study doctors. Next, please. You can see I'm about a minute over time. Um, so I do wanna thank you for your patience. I wanna share with you that we have a total of nine study sites where families and patients can enroll. Four of them are in the United States. A fifth one in North America is in Canada. Um, almost all of our sites have been activated and ready to enroll. Uh, we have one more site that is very close to being up and ready in Brazil, and we very much look forward to that. And then next, please. I just wanted to share that this is our website, and we are very grateful that our first uh, patient in the Galaxy study was dosed earlier this year. Next, please. And once again, this would not have been possible without the patients, the families, the caregivers, and our wonderful clinical investigators and study doctors who have made this possible. Uh, we have had a great partnership with Dr. Jim Wilson and the University of Pennsylvania, and I look forward to your questions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Alzadi. Um, again, if you have questions for Dr. Alzadi or any of the presenters, please do put them in the chat box at the bottom of your Zoom um, control panel. I would now like to welcome Dr. Asif Parker. Um, who is joining us from Swan Bio. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, Dr. Parker. Over to you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, can I share my slides? Yeah, you can just go ahead. The share screen okay. functionality is open. Yes. Can you see my slides okay in the presentation mode? Yes. Okay. Uh, great. Um, thank you. Um, and and good, good evening, everyone. I, am, I want to thank, thank Bob. Laura, Keely, and ULF team for, for organizing this wonderful webinar. And thank you for providing me this opportunity to speak with you. It's a true pleasure. I am Asif Parker. I'm a neurologist and a clinical development expert. Um, and I'm, I'm saying that because I want, uh, this, this session is about clinical trials and I, want, I will be happy to answer any questions that you have, not only for gene therapy, but, but about participation in a clinical trial or, or, or and what are the challenges or, or benefits could be about, it, about the participation in a study. Just to give a quick background, um, I was part of the Lorenzo's Oil clinical trial team at Kennedy Krieger um, just a few years ago. And from there, I moved to Bluebird Bio where I led the team that designed and run the clinical trial that led to approval of gene therapy product for cerebral ALD. Today, Today, what I want to do is, uh, and, and I have a very short amount of time, I want to give you a short introduction to gene therapy and how gene therapy approach for AMN is different than the inflammatory cerebral type. Um, so let's jump into that. Genes are made, of, made up of DNA, which are blueprints to build proteins that makes our body work. For example, ABCD1 protein is built by the gene affected in ALD, and that protein helps break down of very long chain fatty acids. If you have a mutation in ABCD1 gene, results in non-functional protein that results in, 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 a, in a faulty breakdown of very long chain fatty acids, resulting in increase in very long chain fatty acids in the blood. Uh, gene therapy introducing, introduces a working version of that faulty ABCD1 gene into the cells. The gene that is, and, the cell, and this, this is the gene that's in charge of creating ABCD1 protein. This is done by using a vector, which, often, which is often derived from a virus. 
but the viral genes have been removed. Uh, and this is a very important distinction you have to know that the, the, these are not viruses that are, in, are, are injected in, in patients and people. These are vectors that are manufactured in the labs. Um, only therapeutic genes, so in these vectors, through these vectors, only therapeutic genes are delivered into the cells. The modified cells the, then produce the protein that was missive, that was missing or defective prior to the treatment. There are two types of gene therapies. In the vector that the vector can either be delivered outside of the body, which is ex vivo therapy, and in this slide, um, this on the uh, on your left side of the screen, the cell derived therapy or ex vivo gene therapy. And and so the ex vivo approach is used to treat cerebral form, uh, the blue blood bios gene therapy. Blood stem cells are removed by a blood draw. Then stem cells are modified using a vector to deliver a working copy of that 40 gene in these cells in the lab. And then patients undergo a myeloablative uh, therapy or chemotherapy. And the purpose is to make room for these modified cells in the bone marrow. This is ex vivo gene therapy, meaning cells are removed from the patient, then altered and given back uh, to patient. And, and it's shown here, cells going out, getting um, the, the then new gene is introduced and then they're injected back in the, in the body. This approach is not appropriate for AMN. For them, in vivo treatment, in vivo injection of AAV or a, a, gene, or a gene therapy would be more helpful. And that's on the right side of this slide. So AEV vector, and, and, and um, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I'm speaking after Samia, who has given a, a, a good amount of background on AEV, so I'll be very quick on that. Um, AEV vector um, carrying the working copy of ABCD1 is injected directly in the CSF, the fluid that surrounds the spinal cord and the brain. And with this injection, AEV9 vector will deliver the functional copy of the gene to the cells of spinal cord. This will provide cells the opportunity to produce healthy ABCD1 protein to slow or stop down the AMN disease. With this approach, we do not have to collect stem cells. We do not have to use myeloablative chemotherapies for this therapy to work. It's a direct injection of the drug into the CSF or cerebrospinal fluid. This is the same fluid that Samia was talking about. This CSF is, is around our in the brain, in the spinal cord. Just to clarify, there's a small difference in, in infusion in, in those kids um, that Samia was the patient that Samia was talking about, they're injecting it through cisterna magna or through the neck. And, and what we plan to do is to deliver it through a spinal tap or lower spinal cord because this the gene therapy is targeting the spinal cord. We want to go to brain, but spinal cord is the main target here. Now I'll walk you through, through, let me go to the next slide. Now I'll walk you through how AEV delivers ABCD1 gene to the cells of the CNS. In this photo, an AEV vector is shown here. It is about, it's carrying an ABC, ABCD1 gene in there and it's, it's about to enter the cells. This vector um, will deliver its payload to the nucleus. So for the injection, AEV is endocytosed um, and at the cell membrane, and, and, and the cytosine through the cell membrane and transported to the nucleus, gene enters the nucleus and form a round episome uh, there where it lives. So the, the, the new gene actually lives separately than the DNA that's in the nucleus. This is the final destination of the gene. From here, this gene is translated, transcribed, all that what it means in, 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 a, in easy English, in normal English is that it produces healthy ABCD1 protein from that nucleus and which is transported to the peroxisomes where it gets to work. So it goes in in the nucleus, it lives in there and then produces the healthy gene, healthy protein in the, in, in the very long, in, in, that goes to peroxisomes. This is a one-time therapy. The patients can receive this therapy for one time only and they should, and, and, and what, what all gene therapy companies are, are trying to do is to make sure the, the dose that they select for these patients is a dose which can 
using that through the, that dose, patient can get the maximum benefit. That's very different than small pills or, or the small molecule therapies where you can in, gradually increase the dose up until you reach a dose where you see the maximum efficacy. Here, you have to be, um, you have to be uh, very careful and deliver the dose that is, um, that is, that has, that can provide direct benefit to the patients. AV is not a new therapy. It's not a new modality. AV, AV gene therapy has been studied in clinical trials for past two decades. And, and over 3,000 patients have received these therapies. These numbers may have gone up even higher. This is the last time there's no really a published data set, but from the, from the published studies and, and from the Zolgensma's work that we know. Two AV ther therapies have been approved and are commercially available. AV2 gene therapy for an eye disease and AV9 gene therapy for children with spinal muscular atrophy or SMA. The AV9 used for SMA is, is, is a similar vector, AV9, to what we are using for AMN. Uh, but for SMA, the drug product delivered gene needed for SMA patient. And for the, the SBT101 delivers the gene, the ABCD1 gene needed for AMN patients. I'll pause here and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll really, uh, change the, 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 the topic a little bit. For patients, when they're considering gene therapy studies, I want to emphasize is they should discuss the risks and benefits with their physicians, with their investigators, um, and if they can, and 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 the other experts who who are who 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 can comment on that, um, especially for AMN, which is relatively slowly progressive disease. Gene and, and a common notion in 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 that is that gene therapy can be curative. You should question that. Gene therapy may not be curative. This is something that you should discuss. And, and all of us are learning about the safety profile of these patients as we do more research, we do more investigation. I think this is something that I want to emphasize that for gene therapy, please discuss risks and benefits with your physicians. I'll conclude here. Our program have two types of studies. Now, now we have to have two studies. One is treatment study, one is natural history study. The good news is that treatment study is ready to, to enroll. Uh, in this study, we're investigating AAV9 for AMN patients. If you are interested, uh, please email um, Eileen Sawyer. And, and through you can use it through this email address here, clinicaltrials at swanbiotx.com. Um, she can give you more information about, uh, about, the, um, about the study. In addition to this, this is a, a small gene therapy study. We want to understand. Um, we want to understand how this. We want to understand how this, how this therapy will affect the progression of this disease. For that reason, we we are studying. We're conducting a natural history study that will give us a, 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 a idea about progression of this disease when it's, when patients are not treated. That study. I'm pleased to share that we have completed enrollment in this study. So last year we were we were enrolling more and more patients. We have, we have, now we have reached that number. Um, this study is now close to enrollment, um, and now those patients will be followed for two years, and they will provide a comparator data set uh, for this treatment study. Thank you. Uh, if you if you have questions for me, put it in the chat. I will respond. Um, otherwise, I will. Uh, through Laura and in ULF office, I will email you back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Parker. I know we had a couple of questions from the AMN uh, patient community come in through the registration process, and we'll make sure that you get those. Um, thank you again for your presentation. If they're in chat, I can answer right now. Sure. Please. I'll uh, pop them into the chat, and I, I see there's one or two that's um, come up. I would next like to welcome Dr. Andreas Meyer from Vigil Neuro. Dr. Meyer, thank you very much for making the time to be here this evening and to share an update on your efforts. Over to you. Oh no, definitely. Thank you. It's it's my pleasure. Uh, quick question: Like, will you be sharing the slides, or should I pull those up? I can, or if you prefer to share it yourself, oh, it's like totally if, up to you. If you if if you have them, okay, that's that will be perfect. Just one second. Awesome. 
Thank you. Yeah, so thank, thank you very much, first and foremost, for um, the invitation here and the opportunity to speak a little bit about uh, Vigil Neuroscience, about our current pipeline, and, and very specifically about our program in ALSP. Uh, if you go to the next slide, maybe a few words on Vigil. So Vigil is a, is a fairly new um, company. It's been founded a little over two years ago. Uh, we are based like right in the heart of, of Cambridge in Massachusetts. Um, but even though it's a still young company, it was founded with a clear mission in mind, uh, namely to treat rare and common neurodegenerative diseases by restoring the vigilance of microglia, uh, the, the brain's sentinel immune cells, and then basically the key immune cells um, overall for, for, for the brain. And in this, we at Vigil, we are seeking to employ um, basically all the tools available in modern neuroscience today for drug development to see that we can deliver precision medicine-based therapies to improve, um, hopefully, going forward, the lives of, of patients and their, their families. Go to the next slide, please. So with regard to what we are actually doing at the moment um, with regard to our programs, um, in our current pipeline, um, we are at the moment focused on the development of agonists um, of the TREM2 receptor. Um, it's also called the triggering receptor expressed on myeloid cells, number two, which is expressed on the surface of uh, microglia cells as well. And we um, have currently two programs for this in development here shown on the um, left-hand side. This is our lead program. I will speak a little bit more about in the uh, following minutes. Um, this is our TREM2 monoclonal antibody program for the treatment of ALSP. And then here on the right-hand side, this is a small molecule uh, TREM2 agonist program, which um, we hope um, to bring into larger new degenerative um, indications going, going forward. Um, this program currently is still in an early um, kind of IND, pre IND um, study state. Go to the next slide, please. So, this gives you a little bit of an overview um, of our current activities here on the, the top shown. Um, the activities for our lead program, BGL101, our antibody program. Uh, we have an ongoing phase one study um, in healthy volunteers at the moment, which is run in sites here in the US and in Australia. We are on track to start later this year. So in, in a few weeks, basically, our um, phase two study in ALSP. And Beyond ALSP, we are also thinking about um, potential other indications, leukodystrophies, which might be relevant for VGL101 going forward. And then here at the bottom, um, this is a set like our um, small molecule program, which is an IND enabling studies at this time. Go to the next slide, please. So maybe just a few words on microglia. <clears throat> microglia are the um, are the key kind of immune cells in, in the brain. Um, they have, as you can see here in the box on the, on the right, um, they um, have multiple functions, um, including the recognition and elimination of uh, foreign material invaders um, and the repair of local uh, damage to CNS tissue, um, for example, resulting from injury. Um, they are also very important for neural circuit modulation and in like overall maintaining brain homeostasis. The TREM2 receptor is a key mediator and activator of, of microglia. Um, and that's also what makes it an interesting, very attractive target for, for our uh, molecules. And conversely, if microglia is dysfunctional, um, there's this increasing evidence from, from various um, dis disorders um, in the kind of rare disease space where we are looking in, but, but also uh, in the larger context of neurodegenerative disorders, that dysfunctional microglia is 
um, associated with, um, as I said, like rare diseases and, and, and neurodegenerative conditions going, including like Alzheimer's disease, for example. So here on this slide, I just want to speak a little bit about ALSP, or um, uh, which which stands for. Ultimately, it's it's a description of the neuropathological findings in in patients with ALSP. It stands for adult leukoencephalopathy with spheroids and pigmented glia. It is um, falls under the um, umbrella of leukodystrophies. Um, we estimate that it's it's approximately ten thousand patients here in the US. The, um, it's an adult onset uh, disorder. The mean age of onset is in like the early 40s, um, usually. It's a hereditary condition with an autosomal, uh, autosomal dominant uh, pattern of inheritance. And it is caused specifically by a mutation in the CSF1R gene. Like in literature, you will often find that it's also called like CSF1R related ALSP. Um, with regard to the clinical picture, um, the clinical picture can make the diagnosis specifically in the beginning a little bit uh, complicated and, and difficult. Um, very often, like the initial symptoms are um, psychiatric symptoms, like mood changes. Um, they can, um, these patients often show like cognitive impairment, and, and that leads often to like specifically as said in the initial uh, stages to, to misdiagnoses like Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, um, primary progressive MS uh, is something which, which is sometimes considered in the beginning. And then ultimately the genetic testing and identification of the CSF1R mutation confirms the diagnoses. And unfortunately for ALSP patients to date, there is no, um, there are no approved therapies um, available and no really sufficient experimental treatments either at this, this point in time. We go to the next slide. So now the question um, is like how, um, like how an antibody like VGL101 as the TREM2 targeting antibody can be helpful in, in, in ALSP. Um, and as you can see here, um, looking at the graph, like on the left-hand side, this shows you um, basically the cell membrane. Um, and on, on top of it sits the CSF1R receptor. Um, as I said, the CSF1R receptor is very important as well, like for brain, um, for, for homeostasis, well-being, health of microglia. Um, the mutation ultimately causes loss of function of these CSF1R receptors. Um, and that like downstream ultimately leads to um, the dysfunction of, of microglia and, and then ultimately the leukodystrophy uh, presentation in, in, in this disease. Um, and as you can see here on the graph on the right-hand side, this shows you the TREM2 receptor, um, which as, as mentioned is also um, uh, basically expressed on the surface of microglia cells. And as you can see, both receptors actually are transmembrane receptors, so reaching through the cell membrane into the, the inner uh, compartment of the cell. And what happens if either one is activated is that both then uh, successively activate another kind of mediator protein, which is called DEP12. And this then in succession activates um, spleen tyrosine kinase or sh short, um, uh, also called SUC. Um, which then has um, basically kicks off like a whole lot of downstream um, activities and functions. And as you can see, both receptors um, signal through the same cascade through DUP12 and SUC. And we think that by <clears throat> activating the TREM2 receptor, we can compensate and then rescue part of the, the loss of function through caused by um, the, the uh, mutation in the CSF1R receptors. We go to the next slide. So yeah, for the last few minutes, I'm, I'm really um, delighted uh, to tell you a little bit more about our um, phase two study and, and the design of it. Um, as said, um, we are on track to start this trial um, towards the end of this year. 
um, which for for all of us at Vigil, I mean, it's it's very exciting and it's it's, it's definitely a significant milestone. Um, this trial is set up, uh, will be run as an open label proof of concept trial, uh, meaning it will be uh, the first initial trial. It will not be randomized at this point in time. Um, so all patients included will receive um, VGL 101. Um, it consists of a screening period, as always, as shown here on the top. Um, and then there will be over 12 month at monthly administrations of VGL 101, um, and then followed by um, a regular follow-up period. We plan to run a primary analysis after patients have completed um, the first six months, um, and then um, continue for another six months and run another additional analysis. Um, patients who will be able to enroll in the trial, um, these are patients who have a confirmed CSF1R gene mutation um, and also have um, already developed clinical symptoms and findings on the MRI, which are consistent with an ALSP diagnosis. And uh, importantly, um, like for milder um, uh, early stage patients, um, we um, definitely kind of want uh, or look into like where the cognitive and emulation status and or clinical and radiological signs um, in where we where we can identify like progression and, and um, have seen um, actually ongoing manifest um, disease over the past year. The specific endpoints we are interested in are on the one hand, um, what you could call like altogether like biomarkers. Uh, so primarily looking into MRI um, related measures and also um, measures in the cerebrospinal fluid, CSF biomarkers, um, where we look at markers of, of target engagement telling that we actually engage uh, the microglia as planned and um, um, then markers which generally um, are considered to be associated with disease progression like NFL. And we will analyze those specifically after the first six months. And then um, at the 12 month time point, we will again um, look at MRI, CSF biomarkers, but also um, look very closely at the clinical um, test batteries we have included in the trial and um, like motor exams and, and other clinical measures. Yeah, and as I said, this, this trial is about to um, start soon. And um, I'm, um, I think my next slide should have been my last. Yeah, so with this, um, I want to thank you um, for giving me this opportunity here. And um, I would be happy to answer any questions you might have at the end of the session. Thank you very much, Dr. Meyer. And just to let you know, we had a lot of questions from the ALSP community come into the registration form. So we really appreciate you sticking around and addressing some sure. <laughs> No, it's much better. Um, thank you. So finally, um, Dr. David Moeller from Poxel will be sharing some updates, <laughs> excuse me, will be sharing some updates via a pre-recorded message as he was unable to join us this evening. Um, but he has shared this video and we will be able to share your questions with him. Um, so please feel free to pop them into the chat. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Pox, uh, Dr. Moeller. Good evening, everybody. I'm David Moeller, Chief Scientific Officer at Poxel. It's a great pleasure to present a brief update on our programs in X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. And I'm really sorry I can't be there in person to take your live questions. So let me go ahead and just share a few slides with you to briefly update you. Um, we are a small European biotech company, and we're focused on developing uh, novel therapeutic agents for metabolic diseases, including orphan diseases like adrenal leukodystrophy. We have two molecules that are in clinical stage development that are shown on this slide, 770 on the left and 065 on the right. 770 is a novel uh, mechanism called AMP kinase that involves regulating metabolism, inflammation, and also protecting cells. 
and it's active in a variety of different disease models, including ALD, as I'll show you. It's also been through the clinic uh, in several studies involving healthy subjects, as well as in two studies with patients who have metabolic forms of liver disease. Very good safety and evidence of efficacy in all of those prior studies. 065 on the right is a modified form of an approved drug called pioglitazone that's used for diabetes. But pioglitazone has certain side effects like weight gain and edema, which are not very uh, well tolerated. In preclinical models, we showed that uh, 065 was as efficacious as pioglitazone and had less of a side effect burden in terms of weight gain and fluid retention. And then in, in the clinic, we've completed phase one studies in healthy subjects showing that it was very well tolerated. And we also showed in a very recently completed study, just completed in the last two or three, week, three weeks called DESTINY1, that 065 was very well tolerated and showed signs of efficacy in a large phase two study involving patients with metabolic liver disease that was conducted over a period of nine months of treatment involving uh, more than uh, 100 patients. So no evidence of significant dose-related weight gain, no evidence of edema, despite the fact that we have pretty good efficacy with 065 in this study. We also have the good fortune to have FDA approval for orphan drug designation for both of these molecules, as well as fast-track designation for both molecules, which should hopefully be able, be able to help us expedite the further development of these compounds for ALD. Our uh, specific interest in ALD would be to focus on adult men with uh, the spinal cord form of disease called AMN or adrenal myeloneuropathy, which as you know, is a very slowly progressive but severe uh, disorder associated with impairments in gait and balance and other, other uh, severe symptoms. The rationale for 770, which is the AMP kinase activator uh, in the case of ALD or AMN is depicted on this slide where there's some evidence in the literature uh, that this could be considered a good idea. And then in addition, we've done a series of preclinical studies involving both patient-derived cells shown on the left side or in the classical animal model, the ABCD1 mouse model uh, shown on the right side. And in both cases, we've shown significant evidence of efficacy with 770. In the case of our other molecule, 065, the one that's related to pioglitazone, there's also independent evidence that this could be considered as an approach to uh, ALD, and that's in part based on pioglitazone, but also based on liraglitazone that you may be familiar with. In this case, we showed a similar profile, both in the patient-derived cells on the left, as well as in the classical animal model on the right, improvements in VLCFA, very long chain fatty acids, and also improvements in the phenotype of these mice. And with both of our two lead molecules, despite the fact that they work through different mechanisms, we've shown consistent effects uh, in the animal model that are associated with other kinds of efficacy, including histologic benefits in the nervous system on the left, as well as improvements in several neurological tests as depicted on the right. Recently, over the course of the last two or three months, uh, all of the preclinical results I just briefly um, highlighted for you have been now published in two independent articles uh, on the left with 770 in the Journal of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics on the right uh, it, with 065 in the Journal of Inherited Metabolic Disorders. And I would encourage you to look at these papers if you'd like. So what's our plan going forward? We are still poised to begin um, two independent phase 2A studies, one with 770, one with 065. And these two uh, phase 2A studies would involve 12 to 24 patients, adult men with AMN, who would be treated for a period of 12 weeks where we would monitor safety, pharmacokinetics, and then importantly, look at specific biomarkers like elevated uh, very long chain fatty acids and others to be able to detect potential signs of efficacy. These trials have not yet begun, and we are still waiting for um, some additional financing for our company to be able to initiate these trials. And as soon as we have the financing in place, we'll be able to initiate the studies as soon as possible thereafter. And we're eagerly uh, awaiting uh, some financing that we hope will come through in the next couple of months. So I'm gonna pause here and thank you again for your attention. And um, hopefully, I'll be able to join you in person uh, at, at the uh, next meeting of, uh, of all. So take care, and thank you very much.
Thank you very much to Dr. Muller for sharing that update, even though he was not able to join us today. I know that is appreciated by the community, and we will send your questions to Dr. Muller as well, or to Poxel, um, if, if you're from the AMN community and you submitted a question. Um, so I believe that brings us to um, the conclusion of the presentations, and we can start the Q&A session. If you have any questions for the presenters, uh, please put them through to the chat right now. Otherwise, uh, what I'm going to do is just start asking some of the questions that were asked through the registration form. Um, and thank you very much to um, Dr. Meyer and Dr. Alzadi for, for joining us for the Q&A session in person. We really appreciate you taking the time for that. Um, so we've got a kind of a general question from a member of the community who wanted to know how long after the end of a phase two trial is a data available to the public. I know that um, people are often very keen to know what happened after a phase two trial is it moving forward. What can you share about timing or suggestions for where they could look to find that out? And I can put that out to, doc, to both of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's an excellent question and I I, um, I appreciate how eager the patient community is to hear about um, uh, phase two data and, and I the honest answer is that it is variable it depends on the clinical trial it depends on the progress of the trial it depends on the data of the trial um, and and I can only speak on behalf of passage where at the end of any phase two study, the safety data has to be reviewed by the oversight committees. Every clinical trial has several oversight committees, including some of the regulatory agencies where it has to be reviewed um, before it can proceed to uh, what we call the confirmatory phase or sometimes a phase three studies. Uh, so I don't know that there is a specific timeline as to when the data is released or a standard timeline. I think it's largely dependent on when the data is reviewed by oversight committees. Um, and how it informs moving forward and, and progressing after that um, before it could be shared with, with the patient community. And then I'll, 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 I'll leave it to Dr. Meyer if he has anything else to add. No, yeah, I completely agree with that. It, it can be variable. Uh, I mean, generally, I would say specifically in, in, in given the importance like in, in rare disease trials, I would say as, as soon as possible. Um, sometimes you need a little time to for example, if you have biomarkers, it takes a little bit of time for the labs to run it and the data needs to be cleaned up. And, and so that can take like several weeks to a few months even sometimes to kind of analyze everything. And it's also the case, I think that the data will probably not come like all at once, um, but there may be like initial releases and, 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 and then you would continue like with the analyses and then get like, like uh, additional analyses on, on further data you, you might have. Um, and generally, I think that uh, the, the plan will be um, to have a publication like probably within the year past um, the conclusion of the trial. So, and and nowadays it's 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 um, it's generally also that that ultimately all of the data will um, um, will will be um, just uh, presented at some some time, um, like in the past, where where sometimes specifically if trials were negative, you, you often didn't hear so much about it anymore. So I think that is is certainly not the case. And um, as said, I think as, as soon as possible. Thank you very much both for, um, for tackling that question. We've got another one here that's quite general. Um, someone wants to know, um, there are different models. We heard about mouse models or dog models, fish models. They wanted to know how you decide which animal model is most appropriate for your for your product or your study. You can go ahead, Dr. Mario, and I'll follow you, or if you want me to start. Yeah, it, it's it's probably the same. It's it's also variable. So we employ like several different models, um, and that's that's the common suspects, I think. So it's it's usually like rodent models you will imply. Um, and it is um, non-human primate models, um, which which probably are are kind of some of the most important ones. 
uh, to generally use. And then another aspect is that for many programs as well, like in vitro studies, so not even in, in animal models, but even before um, can have like great relevance. So I echo that. And, and in terms of for our clinical trials, there are some animal models that what we call spontaneous models. These are naturally occurring animal models. Uh, for example, I can speak mostly for the Crab A program. There's a mouse model that is naturally has Crab A disease. So these are not animal models that were created in labs for the purpose of, of um, testing necessarily. These were already naturally occurring models and the dog model. But generally speaking, especially um, well, in, in, in any clinical trial, but uh, for rare disease and in gene therapy, you do want to aim to test um, your therapies in a model, animal model that captures the clinical symptoms um, in a way that is closest to when you are translating it to humans or translating it to children, um, that you can have a good sense of how it would translate. Uh, so if you assess it in, in, a, in an animal model, you want to make sure that animal model has some symptoms that you can look at, okay, how are how are the symptoms um, stopping? How is it stopping the symptoms from progressing? How is it preventing the symptoms from occurring? But also in what we talked about biomarkers, Dr. Meyer earlier mentioned the biomarkers, you wanna be able to measure those biomarkers in the animal model. So anything that would be the closest to um, representing the disease that we would, or the disease symptoms that we would see in children. Thank you very much. We have another general question before we get into some specifics. Um, a member of the ALL community would like to know how you choose which specific leukodystrophy to tackle uh, within your company. How does the company decide that? So I, um, we do have uh, a clinical trial that is ongoing for CREB A, uh, which is a form of leukodystrophy. And um, we were very excited earlier this year to have an IND, which is um, an investigational new drug uh, approval to um, uh, proceed with our metachromatic leukodystrophy. And uh, our CRAB A leukodystrophy is ongoing and, and, and we are continuing to recruit. Um, and the patient community has been very supportive and, and uh, we've he heard about referrals and we've received referrals for the trial. For our metachromatic leukodystrophy, we hope to advance this clinical trial. Um, given the limited resources, um, we have been monitoring our financial resources exceptionally judicious, judicious in managing these, um, and we have chosen to pause this. We do recognize there are children um, that are waiting for this clinical trial, and we hope to uh, resume or, or launch this in clinical trial in the near future. How is the choice made in terms of which leukodystrophy? And that's an excellent question. And it's, um, I come from a background of where I was conducting the clinical gene therapy trial in spinal muscular atrophy. And I did have patients in my clinic with various leukodystrophies. And at the time, unfortunately, there were no gene therapy trials. Um, so it is very difficult as a clinician and as a uh, scientist to know that some, ther some diseases have therapies um, that are in progress and others don't. And it's really a collaboration and partnership in terms of what animal models are available, what has been tested in the animal models and how much progress has been made. Um, and I don't, I don't necessarily think there is a, um, it, it's an approach of being selective as opposed to what can be assessed and um, how advanced do the experiments get to a point where they can brought, be brought to, to clinic. Uh, so we are very privileged to be in the field for both CREB A and hopefully soon in metachromatic leukodystrophy. But um, that's in terms of where we're at in Passage Bio. And I don't know if any of my colleagues who are doing um, some of the adrenal leukodystrophy are still on the call, but maybe I'll leave that to them. Thank you. Um, we have a question uh, about the AAV vector that we've heard. We have someone who would like to know whether there have ever been comparisons of efficacy between stem cell-based therapy and AAV therapy for various leukodystrophies. Or perhaps in general, how have studies compared which might make a better vector in which circumstances? Uh, Dr. Meyer, I feel like I'm, uh, I don't want to be 
uh, speaking, not giving you an opportunity, but I can I can try to answer that for where we're at. Yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, generally, we are not. I have some experience like with gene therapy from from my previous life, but um, I'm I'm not aware of um, significant comparisons between those two, like with regard to efficacy. Uh, but I said, like, this is not my my current area. Um, we are focused on antibodies and small molecular development at this point. Uh, so I, I think there are a couple of ways to approach this. I think the, the question is quite broad. Um, to break it down, there are different viruses that are being used in the viral vector gene therapy world. Uh, for example, adrenal leukodystrophy, we know that uh, lentivirus was, was used. So um, there, I think Dr. Um, Parker, I think maybe he, he presented how there are different ways of approaching gene therapy. You can either directly inject it into the human, similar to what we use in AAV, or in some instances, you can um, uh, uh, withdraw cells from the patient, treat those cells, and then return them um, with or without uh, stem cell transplantation. So it, it varies, and I know it can be very, very confusing for, for families. Um, but it very much depends on the disease, what is known to have been offered in the disease, what has been uh, shown some uh, success, whether modest or great success. Uh, we do recognize that in, in our crab A patients that there are patients that are referred to stem cell transplantation. Uh, there is no what we call head-to-head -head trial, a direct comparison of the AAV versus the stem cell transplantation at the moment um, that we are conducting. Our goal is to assess if AV alone as a gene therapy um, is sufficient without the stem cell transplantation, could it um, uh, demonstrate uh, comparable results? Uh, we know that, uh, I think it was mentioned that there have been other AV gene therapy products that have shown uh, significant and remarkable outcomes with just the gene therapy alone. So that that's what our that's kind of the position that our company is at right now in terms of crab A. Uh, we are not doing a combination approach. Um, I do understand that there are some other companies that have an approach where AV gene therapy uh, is delivered after stem cell transplantation. Um, but I, to answer that question, I don't know that there is a um, direct comparison, like a side to side, what we call head to head comparison. Thank you very much, Dr. Alzadi. Um, we have just another question here from a parent of a child with MLC1, and I'm not sure whether either of you would be able to tackle this one or whether we could do some further research, but um, they heard that gene therapy would not be the preferred approach for clinical trials in their condition. Has there been any new evidence to suggest that gene therapy could potentially work in MLC1? Uh, the honest answer is I, I I will not be able to weigh in. Unfortunately, I do not have. I am a child neurologist and I, and I may have seen patients in the clinic, but I unfortunately don't have direct experience in gene therapy uh, for MLC1 um, patients. So I, I apologize. I, I would be misleading you. I'm more than happy to look into it and research it and share anything that I can find with Laura or Bob to, to share it. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll definitely find uh, someone who can answer that question or provide insight. We appreciate that. Um, Dr. Meyer, I have a few questions for you <laughs> from the community, from the ALSP community. Um, the first question that I have here is um, whether your clinical trials will also include bone marrow patients. Um, most likely we will at least in the beginning, not be able at this point to include bone marrow transplant patients um, with the, um, with, I mean, one of the big considerations is, is that um, um, you, it will be difficult to determine the actual treatment effect of any treatment if you basically have two experimental treatments at the same, at the same time, not knowing exactly like how one uh, works versus the other, or if there are like how, how the effects play out individually. So it may not be um, possible to for us to, um, in the initial stages, at least to include patients with fire bone marrow transplant. So ongoing discussions, but that may uh, may not be possible. 
Thank you. Uh, we have a question from the LSP community here, but Dr. Alzadi, you are also welcome to weigh in because I believe this is a consideration in a number of conditions. They wanted to know whether there is a treatment to reverse demyelination damage. Do you know of any um, approaches or do any of your therapies potentially address demyelination damage? I apologize, I missed which, um, which disease category. That came from the ALSP community, um, but it's just a general question about whether there's anything that can reverse demyelination damage, um, any treatments or approaches that you might be aware of. So I'll open that question up to both you, Dr. Meyer and Dr. Alzadi. Oh, I, I appreciate the question. And, and to be fair, I, I am wearing my plastic bio hat, so I, I, I'm not wearing my child neurologist hat. And in terms of, at least for Crabe, when we are looking to deliver this therapy, the goal is to either stop the progression of demyelination or, or dysmyelination where the myelin is damaged or, or prevent it from occurring in children if we catch them early on. The question of whether you can remyelinate after gene therapy, um, that is the hope. If, that, if the therapy is effective, that is the hope that we look to see um, in our patients. And, and hopefully we'll, we'll see that with time in the clinical trial. Um, so so I'm, um, I, I'd love to be able to give general responses, but I think it's very much disease specific and dependent on the therapy that's being delivered and what the animal studies have demonstrated. Thank you. Dr. Meyer, do you have anything to add in terms of- no, I, Yeah, I agree. I think, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, there is no general treatment for the reversal of, of such conditions. And, and often, depending on how far neurodegeneration in, in general has progressed, the more difficult it is to, to kind of achieve any meaningful reversal. Um, so it is indeed like very often about kind of holding up the process and, and basically stopping it or catching it very early and, 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 and preventing uh, it from manifesting. Thank you. We have another question also from the ALSP community. Is there a possibility for a chemoless bone marrow transplant? So is it possible to have a bone marrow transplant that doesn't involve chemotherapy? So I'm, I'm, I'm not a bone marrow transplant specialist, I, I must say before, but I doubt that there um, will be good options, at least at the moment, to avoid like co-treatments as they are currently done. Thank you. Um, and we have one other question from the ALSP community, which is a little more broad. And that question is, um, what is what is your company doing to connect with the adult community, both symptomatic and asymptomatic? And I, I think certainly you being here this evening to share updates is an example of one way that you're looking to connect with the community. Is there anything else that you can share about um, Vigil and the you know the adult community? Yeah. So I mean, what we what we what was not on the on the slides, but we, we have an ongoing natural history study um, in order to kind of just generally learn more and, and kind of understand like the disease and, and how it affects patients and their families better. Um, so that is, is, is one um, additional activity we have. And then in, um, in addition to the natural history study, we also have a patient registry, which is um, open in, um, in the US and a few European countries in order to basically allow um, everybody um, to, to share um, kind of information about their, their status and, 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 and how um, they, they are doing, um, which includes um, basically carry up, uh, carriers as well who have not developed symptoms and symptomatic patients, so everybody um, from the community community can participate there. And then specifically with the um, with the start of our phase two program, we will see that we continue to be like present as much as we can. We are a small company, but we we um, we certainly will try to um, become visible even more than that might have been the case before. 
And um, I'm personally and other of my colleagues, like we're always happy as well. Like if somebody directly reaches out, um, I have like very nice colleagues in, in my um, patient advocacy, uh, in our patient advocacy group. So that's, that's, it's always an option if there's any question. And then if there are general questions and um, like help is needed, I think um, it was shown on one of the slides, um, Sisters Hope as, as a um, patient organization, patient advocacy organization specifically for ALSP patients, I think is a very good place as well to find like additional information and, and some guidance if needed. Wonderful, thank you for sharing that. We have another question that came in, um, which I'll open to both of you to weigh in on. What is the process and timeline for completion of, a, of phase one, two trials um, to, open, um, to opening up the inclusion criteria for other patients that are currently excluded or FDA approval? So I believe what's being asked is how long does it typically take to complete phase two trials, um, phase one, two trials, and then how long might it take to expand that inclusion criteria beyond what you might have had before and then to get to FDA approval? That's a very difficult question to answer as well, because- A lot of good difficult very, questions. Yeah, this very, much, very much depends really on the, the design of the individual trial, how long the treatment duration is in the trial, if there is an additional um, period at the end, like a, what's, what's often called like an extension study. And then with regard to changing or expanding the, the criteria, this is also something which very much depends on what you have learned from your initial trial, um, which either will allow or not allow to kind of change those criteria and with allowing i mean that you need to have a good understanding and 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 a good idea that this, this therapy will actually help those patients if you change the criteria um, so i think that's it's probably the most specific answer i can give um, to this and like generally um, drug development and that I think applies for rare disease and, and for like larger indications as well. That's that's a several, usually a several year process until you get to FDA approval. Yeah, and we know that um, companies and CROs, their partners are doing absolutely everything they can to speed through that process every single day. Um, it feels like a lifetime when you're waiting, but every single day, I promise you, people are working to, to make it as fast as possible. Um, Dr. Alzadi, did you want to weigh in on that or, you know, maybe perhaps answer the second component around FDA approval and how long does it take to go from a phase two to FDA approval? Uh, well, I, I, I think, I, I mean, I couldn't agree with Dr. Moore. It's it, and I, I do want to recognize, and I totally understand that families, and it, it does seem like a lifetime in, in trying to understand the process and, and the planning for, for your child's future, or your family member's future. It, it makes it very difficult. Um, I think one of the things that is key to remember is that these, when the phase one, two trials are designed, um, they are designed to look at the safety of these investigational therapies. Um, and I want to emphasize they are still investigational therapies until you demonstrate that they are safe and can be effective. Um, and, and that's that's why these phase one, two studies are designed so that um, you can capture and monitor um, any response, any side effect um, that could potentially occur. Now, the process depends on uh, the design of the trial. Um, the design of the trial depends on the disease, depends on the product, depends on the target population. So it, it, it's definitely a variable um, in the time it takes once move, you move from your phase one, two informs your safety and informs how you move on, as Dr. Meyer mentioned, to the next phase of, of your study. Um, and that's where you, if you do have um, positive results from your phase one, two, or, or demonstrate um, some efficacy or that it could potentially be effective, you do have to follow it with um, a, another phase to uh, confirm that that ef efficacy, and um, and you go and depending on how soon and, and the how significant the difference is in the response to the treatment, 
um, I think that also informs how soon you can go to the FDA for approval. Thank you very much. We have one more question here from the ALSP community. So this one is for you, Dr. Meyer. Um, the question is, what are you doing to ensure that doctors and patients are educated about the disease, um, the potential therapy, and the risks? So if you could share a bit about what Vigil Neuro is doing to educate physicians or the physicians on your trial and patients as well. So yeah, like for the trial specific, and I think that's something which applies to like generally all clinical trials, though the um, the trials usually are conducted by like physicians in, in hospitals or office-based physicians. And those um, investigators, they are specifically trained. Um, that's usually done at what's called like an investigators meeting where you basically go through all the details of the clinical protocol, like the preclinical data, the safety data you have to, to that point in time and make sure that everything is, 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 is basically clear from that perspective. And um, like with regard to patients participating in, in clinical trials, um, it is generally that the investigator um, will be able to kind of inform um, like around the, the potential risks uh, about potential other alternatives for treatment and, and ultimately should have a discussion with the patient interested in participating in a clinical trial um, to see if this participation is, is something which um, um, is, is something like like both sides basically think that it's a good thing to, to engage in this clinical trial, clinical trials um, like ours, like the upcoming one, it, it's basically a one year commitment. Um, and that is something I think which needs to be thoroughly discussed, um, understood, and then, then agreed upon. And um, I think I would always encourage to ask questions as well. Like if there's an interest in participating in the clinical trial to really discuss everything with the with the investigator and make sure that there are no open questions left in the end, because that's that's ultimately um, should be a very conscious process and that will only help to kind of make this a successful trial in the end and then not to lead to any. Thank you. You have a really great question that just came in um, and it really ties in with another question that was sent in earlier through the registration process. How often do adverse events stop trials? Um, and I, having a little bit of experience, I wonder if you could talk about what happens when there's an adverse event and what does stopping a trial actually mean? Dr. Mario, do you want to take this one or you want me to get? It's, it's, this is again, like this is, this is a variable thing. Um, I think one thing maybe to, highlight is or to to kind of talk a little bit about what is meant by an adverse event adverse event like in the context of clinical trials is a very general term um, and it basically refers to any untoward um, experience like a trial participation has throughout a trial so from a mild headache um, to like everything else which might happen um, that is included and that also does not automatically mean that these events are actually related to the study drug, to the experimental therapy somebody is receiving. Um, it could be related to something else. It could be, for example, it could be a COVID infection right now, which has caused a little complications like in many trials in over the past two, two years. Um, so that's, that's just important to keep in mind. And if there are significant severe adverse events, that is, is actually something which is not very common um but if it occurs then there are like very clear guidances and mechanisms more or less to make sure that um there is no undue risk for for any of the participating patients and the extreme outcome which again is, is not necessarily that common it really depends on the indication it depends on the trial and it depends on on the, the individual study drug um but like the most extreme outcome, that will be that a trial is, is paused or halted to kind of reevaluate. And um, that also may not necessarily mean that the trial is stopped, but it could be kind of restarted. Um, it, it could just mean an additional like reevaluation phase. Sometimes trials are adjusted 
um, in order to have another kind of um, like we started um, in, in a safe safe way. So that is something which I think is is, 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 is very clearly addressed through like regulatory guidances and, and standards like at the, the companies running these trials. Dr. Azadi, did you want to add anything to that um, before our final question? Well, I think Dr. Meyer articulated that very well. Um, it, it really is coming, comes down to um, the causal relationship to a therapy. If it was something that uh, just occurred because it was going to happen and um, our patients in particular might be more susceptible with Crab A disease or the younger pediatric patient population is more susceptible to infections, to colds, to stomach bugs, to um, symptoms of their disease, the underlying disease. So um, an adverse event could be any of those, but if there is a uh, proven um, or direct relationship as a result of the treatment, um, it doesn't necessarily always result in, as Dr. Meyer mentioned, stopping the trial. Um, it could cause um, the enrollment um, until um, safety measures are enhanced and, and so forth. So it, it, it really comes down to the severity and if there is a direct causal relationship with, to the drug. Thank you. And we have one final question that also lines up really well with a question that just came in, which is around how do you find out about adverse events that have taken place in a clinical trial? Um, and what is, does that look like in an international context? Are sponsors required to disclose that um, so that participants are aware? What does that look like for a sponsor in communicating that out? Yeah, I can start. Absolutely. Um, it, it, it ultimately, it does not matter if a trial is just conducted in the US or if it's run in other countries or if it's run in the US and other countries at the same time. There is, there is one specific key document which every drug in clinical development has, and that is called the investigator's brochure. Um, that is basically a compendium, like, like a um, like summary of all the relevant data you have collected to a given point and like to the, to the actual point in time, like where you are now on your, your drug. It includes like the preclinical findings you have collected, but it also includes um, all the, the clinical data it is updated um, usually on a yearly basis, at least if there are new findings, new data, including adverse events coming in, um, you may have updates more frequently and with regard to ongoing clinical trials, if there are adverse events experienced in another part in, 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 like in the world, um, it is that um, specifically if these are more significant, then these will be urgently communicated to all of the investigators. They will receive like, like, a, like a letter and, and an email. And um, what also happens in the same context then is that very quickly the uh, informed consent forms or the document you, you sign at the beginning of a clinical trial, which explains all the risks and and and, and potential adverse events you might expect. Um, so this will be updated and, and patients will be asked to um, re-consent, so more or less to kind of read the updated form, um, make sure that that all the questions they might have are discussed and then sign sign it again. So that's that's the usual process. Yeah, and that I can tell you from working on many clinical trials, that is common. It's common to be re-consented. It's frustrating, but that's exactly why it happens because new information comes to light and that has to be shared with participants. That's a legal requirement. Yeah, there's maybe another another element as well. So all of the, the clinical trials, it's it's they are all supervised also by <clears throat> review boards or ethics committees. Um, so that's usually institutions or centralized institutions where like independent, like an independent party more or less reviewing not only your study protocol, but also the safety information to make sure that there's nothing which is kind of being overlooked and to, um, and th there are reporting requirements as well towards those um, kind of bodies if there are new adverse events. So that's, that's very, very strictly regulated. Thank you, Dr. Alzadi, anything to add? Uh, the only thing I would add is in addition to any adverse events that have been identified within a clinical trial for that particular drug, um, 
uh, as Dr. Meyer uh, mentioned, the investigative brochure and the consent form, there are times where it has to be updated if the class of drugs, for example, we use AAV as the viral vector for our gene therapy. And we understand that with AAV, there have been reported adverse events, not necessarily within our clinical trials, but in the application of AAV. And that is something that you always make sure that is incorporated into your consent forms, your investigator brochure as a possibility um, uh, in terms of side effects so that families are informed uh, before they consent for the clinical trust study. Thank you. And just to put it into context, there are a lot of reasons why clinical trials may be stopped. Uh, a very common one is just that you find the efficacy of the product is not necessarily what was hoped for. That actually happens quite a bit. Um, it could also be safety events that have come to light. It could be lack of enrollment. We didn't have enough individuals to meet the sample size that was needed. There are just a million different reasons. And if you want to learn more about those, <laughs> um, I don't know if you have the slide up, but part two of our clinical trials for rare diseases event is happening next Thursday at this exact same time. And we'll include an educational session, some basic concepts around clinical trials. So if you're interested to know more about adverse events, what is a cohort, how, how do you move through different phases, what does that timing look like, um, and what does the journey of participating in a clinical trial look like for, a, for an individual or a family affected by leukodystrophy, please join us next Thursday, October the 20th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Central Time, um, where we will be going through all of those, and we'll have a wonderful panel of individuals from and advocates from the leukodystrophy community who have experienced participation in a clinical trial and uh, we'll be able to share what their experiences were like, um, and you'll be able to ask them questions about that. If you haven't registered but would like to, please reach out to Keely or to the ULF, and they'll be able to make sure that you are registered for part two of our clinical trials for rare diseases. Um, so with that, I'd really like to thank everyone who participated very much. Thank you immensely to the presenters who took their time to share um, updates on their efforts this evening with patient communities. Thank you to everyone who came and uh, logged in in the evening <laughs> um, and is taking, and thank you for taking this information back to your communities. And thank you to everyone who's watching the registration, uh, who's watching the recorded session uh, of, of, of this event. Um, I'll just turn it over to Bob to say a quick uh, word in closing. All right. Thanks, Laura, especially for leading the webinar and discussion to help everyone learn more about research in the leukodystrophy space. I uh, thought you did a great job and I can't believe our time is up. So it's uh, really good. Uh, I also, I, I have to thank our ULS staff and behind the scenes work. Thanks to Keely and Tara. Uh, next, I really want to thank our industry representatives from Visual Neuro, Swan Bio, Voxel and Passage Bio that presented to us tonight. I know our families appreciate your coming here tonight and helping us learn more about the research and the trials that are taking place at this time as well. Obviously, there are many more companies that are doing clinical trials at this time, but obviously we only had a short amount of time for presentations. So we tried to have a little bit of a variety of presentations. So I think we accomplished that uh, goal here tonight. So we didn't have one form of uh, trial. So that was good. So. One thing, if you want more information about ongoing clinical trials, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov for more information on your specific uh, leukodystrophy. I guess lastly, I too, I wanna thank the families that have attended tonight in person, especially those that will see this later, that I'm hoping you learned something about our clinical trials that are taking place at this time. So I wanna wish all of you the best as you work your way through the complications of life with leukodystrophy. So I'll put one more plug in. Don't forget to tune in next week on October 22nd for our web webinar entitled Clinical Trials for Rare Diseases, Session 2, Clinical Trials 101, Family Perspective. Again, thank you to everyone who attended tonight, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great night.